Yeah, so good morning or good afternoon. Welcome wherever you are. Welcome to you all. Uh, we're excited that we've gotten received so much support for this course. Um, today, Kelly and I will give you a brief presentation on the installation. This is all sort of the pre-event, the main event on the 21st. Um, so maybe just a real quick start here, Kelly, if you don't mind introducing yourself. I'm you Kelly. Are, Thanks, you everybody. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for joining. Um, I'm a software engineer at UNAVCO. Um, Thanks, Kelly. And uh, my name's Tim, and I'm a data engineer at UNAFCO. Um, and then Christine, I think is, yeah, Christine is here, who, our distinguished leader, um, who's running the course on the 21st. Um, and she will be, I think, in the background today, but I'm sure we'll chime in if we've misspoken. <laughs> I, I will, I'm just listening. I just want people to realize that. Uh, Kelly and Tim have put a lot of effort into trying to make the code uh, easy to install. And um, our goals here are to help you get it installed so that you can use the software before October 21st. So that's our big goal. And please help us, uh, give us feedback on things that did or didn't work. And we'll do our best to get everything working as quickly as possible so that you can have a chance to use the software before October 21st. In my experience, you know, actually using the software is one of the best ways to really learn what's going on. And it gives you an opportunity to come up with better questions. And I think the October 21st session will be more valuable for you if you get a chance to use the software. And so the more times you see these principles, the better it'll be for you. So we wanna make the software installation as painless as possible. And um, so I guess, yeah, I think that's all I want to say. Uh, they're going to start out and give you this overview and uh, give you some hints on things to do, but do feel like you can ask questions um, if you're having difficulties with your install. I guess my only other question, my only other comment is there are no dumb Python questions. That that is something is my mantra. It it can be really tricky, um, so don't be shy. Uh, with your questions. Okay, I'll mute myself now. Thanks, Christine. Uh, yeah, Kelly, the next slide, please. Um, so here's, we, I think we sent, or Melissa sent this out, but this will be our schedule for today. We're trying to make this as efficient as possible for your all's time while still offering uh, space to assist as many of you as possible. Um, as Christine mentioned, our primary goal is for everyone to have functioning G GNSS reflectometry code um, so they can do their homeworks in advance of the main session on the 21st. For full disclosure, Kelly and I have never run a course like this. Um, so this will be a very a learning experience for us as well, but we're excited to you know, go on this journey with you. And we've been really excited about the Slack channel so far especially with some students helping each other out, which is really exciting to see, and we hope that can keep up. Uh, next slide. Oh, wait, real quick, just on the schedule. So we'll, we'll do a quick presentation, or, uh, and then we will have these sort of office hours where people can come and go as they need. Um, even after the presentation, we'll offer some time for just general questions if anybody has them, but we're trying to window people into their specific, just to limit the number of people, window them into the specific type of install they're doing, either via the Jupyter Notebooks or the command line. Um, and we'll try to document as much of this in the Slack because we find, we found already that the Slack is a good way if you get, for instance, this one specific error, it's easy to search by that error. And if someone else gets the same error, there's like a record for that. So um, next slide, please, Kelly. So what is GNSS REPL? I don't, first of all, how do we pronounce that? No one really knows, <laughs> at least I don't know. But GNSS REPL is a open source Python software for earth science investigations in the GNSS IR. And the main things here that I want to point out is that A, this is open source code. Every line of this code 
and the software is open and available to you all. You could clone this repository, do anything you like to it at this point. Um, and also with that in mind, open source also means that we're really trying to encourage collaboration. So as Christine mentioned, if you as you run this, if you find bugs, you want new archives, or you can think of if you're better ways to do things that we're already doing, um, let Christine Kelly or I know, or create a GitHub issue, or make a pull request. You know, there's the, there's a lot of ways to communicate these at this point. Secondly, this is in Python. This code is written in Python. There used to be a MATLAB version, which is not currently supported. Um, and the code does still have some Fortran and shell commands, which you'll see later come up in the dependencies of the install. Um, and finally, this is uh, GN, this is obviously a course, or this is getting set up for the course in GNSSIR. This is what you're all here to learn. Um, the primary session on the 21st will cover all the theory, method, and analysis that you all are excited to do for to measure water height, snow height. Uh, but in the meantime, there's a link here and we'll post these slides so no one has to like try to write a link down. Uh, but there's a link here for a lot of great publications on Christine's website if you're interested. Okay, next slide. All right, um, so starting off about the code, like Tim just mentioned that there are some dependencies if you would like to run the code on your local machine. Um, it does require Python 3. Um, right now we're only supporting Linux and Mac. We have seen some people um, use the code on a Windows, but we just currently don't really have the support for that, but you're welcome to try. Um, it does also, since like Tim mentioned, there's some Fortran in the code as well. So it does require GCC and GFortran. Um, also archive access protocols like FTP and WGET and some compression utilities as well. There is one executable that is required for the code, which is the CRX to RNX, which is to help decompress uh, RINX files. You won't actually have to do anything with it. The code does, but it is required to run. The GFC RNX is for, is for RINX3, and tech is also a useful tool to have, but those last two with the two stars are not actually required. Um, and then we put down at the bottom, or you can use Docker. You won't need any of these dependencies because Docker will have that all for you if you end up using the Docker versions instead. So like I mentioned, there's several different ways to install the code. We've tried to make this as available as possible for everybody. Um, so right now we have the command line versions and we also have Jupyter notebooks as well that you can run. And they can also all be run either on your local machine or you can use Docker for either of those. And again, the links are here, but we'll post this so you don't have to scramble to write down or get to the repositories. So just a, a little blurb about Docker. Um, Docker really gives us the ability to run our package in an isolated environment, which is called a container. Containers are really lightweight and they contain everything you would need to run the application. So you don't have to rely what's currently installed on your host, um, which is what makes it really useful. Um, these containers are built using images, which are kind of like a template for if instructions on creating the container. Um, you don't have to worry about the images, we've made them for you. There's generally kind of like a two-step process to running a Docker container. It's usually building the image from a Docker file that we'll provide. You can also pull the image from a, our registry on Docker Hub, um, and then you run the container. So the notebook version installations are the ones um, that I've been generally in charge of. And um, there's several different ways to install the Jupyter Notebooks. We have Docker again, and then without Docker, but even within those, I've offered several options. You can use Docker Hub. You can use the Docker file that I've created for you. And also there's a bash script that'll just run everything for you and set up the containers as well. So, um, I'm going to quickly try to demo using what I think is the easiest method of installing the Jupyter Notebooks, which is doing the using the Docker Hub. So if you give me a minute, I just have to stop sharing and share a different screen.
While Kelly's pulling that up, I just wanted to reemphasize that point that Kelly makes about the goal here is there we're offering the code a number of different ways, but fundamentally it's all coming from it's all generated from this same GitHub repository. So if you access the code in any one of these different ways, you should be doing the same, running the same things, even though if it's you're just interacting with it differently, if that makes sense. I guess what I, I could I, I'll just say one thing about the Fortran. Um, people who've worked with these data before will know that I I had these Fortran translators that translated Rhinex files and, and computed the azimuth and elevation angles you need to do reflectometry. But it was really <clears throat> somewhat complicated to keep all of those working. Plus I was an extra step. Everybody had to compile the Fortran. And, and that wasn't such a friendly thing to do. And so we added a, the ability to read the files in Python. So we, of course, had a, we had a Rhinex reader in Python. <clears throat> and, and that was thanks to our colleagues at Onsala. But what we discovered is it was so slow. It was just ridiculously slow. So we wanted the speed of the Fortran, but with the ease of Python so that people wouldn't have to impile excuse me, they wouldn't have to install and compile Fortran, which is, you know, a skill for the elderly. So um, I found these bindings in the, um, one of the Python libraries. I, did you say it was fpylib or something? Yeah, I can't remember. Anyway, I spent a week of my life trying to figure those out. So what I did is I ported the existing Fortran code into Python. Like, so it, it's, calling the Fortran from within Python. So it's sort of the best of both worlds to a certain extent. You get the speed of the Fortran, um, but you yourself do not have to compile the Fortran like you used to. And you're not forced to use Python, which frankly is just too slow for some of the applications that we have for this project. Okay, so anyway, that's my two cents. When you hear the word Fortran, don't fear that you'll have to install the code. Uh, we've tried to, like she says, for the Dockers, it's you know invisible to you. Um, and even if you use the GitHub version yourself, it's relatively painless. Okay. Yeah, that is true. Um, so uh, I hope everyone can see this. Okay, this is the the Docker repo um, that contains the the Jupyter notebook. And, and has all the notebooks here for you. Here's the Docker file that I was mentioning, but you don't have to worry too much about that. Um, all of the installation instructions are on here. So while I'm just doing this demo, um, don't feel too rushed to uh, try to follow along because it's all here along with even probably more explanation than I might give. Um, so like I mentioned, there's several different ways to install the Jupyter Notebooks. I'm calling this one option one, and I'm saying it's recommended just because I think it's so easy. Um, so this is where that option is. So this is pretty much the only command that you actually need to run. Uh, so what I would do is just copy and paste this. And um, I, I go to my terminal and I would go somewhere where you wanna have files saved uh, from the code. So in a directory, so I'll just change to my demo directory. And then I'm gonna run this command and I'll just explain a couple of things of what it's doing. So the, the main command here is docker run. That's what's going to build the container for you. Um, this dash V is connecting, um, it's creating a volume. So right now I'm, it's creating a, a directory called files on my local machine, and it's gonna connect it to a file in the container, a file directory in the container. So when I put a file in one, it'll be in the other. So if I put files in the Docker, I'll then get those files on my machine, on my local machine, and vice versa. So if I have data I want to bring into the container, I would put it in this volume. Um, this is just naming the container. I'm naming it GNSSREFL Jupyter. And this last part is the important part as well. This is what's going and grabbing the image that we have registered on our Docker Hub. So it's gonna start saying unable to find it locally because it will look on your local machine if you already have um, if you already have the image on 
locally, like I've run this before, it'll be there. Um, but if not, it'll go and it'll find it on the Docker Hub. And so then this will print out and you just copy where it has the token and then put this in your browser. And then from here, you can just run the Jupyter Notebooks. So I think it's really nice and easy because it sets everything up for you and the container has everything in the environment that you need to be able to run these. I also just wanted to show quickly um, using Docker Desktop, which I think is a very useful tool, especially if you're a visual learner to help you understand what's happening with the containers. Um, so the image would be, you can see that this is the image, which you don't have to deal much with. Like I said, it's just kind of a set of instructions for creating the container. And this, I can see that the container is running. If I wanna leave this environment, um, what I would do, excuse me, is you just control C out of it. It will prompt you to say, do you wanna shut this down? You just say yes, and then you're done and you can go back to using the terminal the way you'd like to. You'll notice that this will say that the kernel is dead, meaning that we've closed it. And with the container, it will still be running. You can leave it running. You don't have to stop it. But if you'd like to stop it from the Docker desktop, it's very easy. You can just stop. And then you'll notice that uh, if I tried to reload this, it won't work. But if I start it again, and then I reload this, it'll pop back up. So that's how you would get back into the container. If you're working with the Jupyter Notebooks and you're making your own changes, then um, stopping and starting, the changes will still be there. But if you remove the container, the changes will be lost. And that's why sometimes volumes are important if there's files that you wanted to save locally and to be able to use outside of the container. That's where the volume would come in. Thanks, Kelly. That was great. Um, if you have questions about it, please let me know. But again, a lot of those instructions are in the um, repo. We're, I guess we're, we're not in any rush if anybody has a question right now relevant to what, especially relevant to what Kelly just presented. And if not, we can keep moving along. This, or throwing this, is, the, this is Neil Wynn from the Park Service. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Good morning, Neil. Hey, good morning. Um, for that Docker desktop, is that uh, an install that's listed? Is that that's just something we should know about, or is that listed in the installation that uh, all, all the really good documentation that you listed before? Right. So it is in the, uh, the at the very beginning, and I, I should have mentioned the one thing you do need to install locally is Docker. Um, and I do have lists for where to find and install Docker. And mm -hmm. when you go to the Docker installation, the first thing it pops up is because they very much encourage using it as well, um, is how to install Docker desktop. Okay, it didn't immediately pop up with me. I was using Ubuntu or Ubuntu, however you pronounce it. Um, right. And But it doesn't, that sounds awesome. I'm super thrilled. Uh, there's it's a lot of ways useful. to install this. It's super crazy, but thank you. <laughs> of course. Uh, any other questions? That was a great question. Thanks, Neil. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, well, we can keep moving along. Oops. Okay. Um, can you go back? Is there one in between there? Or is it? Okay, never mind. We'll, we'll go with this. So just a few comments here. I'm going to, on the command line version, um, Many of you, I think, are more comfortable running. If you're not familiar with notebooks or if you're just more comfortable running programs from the command line, there's we have three ways um, to nominally do the same thing. Um, Christine has some great videos on her YouTube page about the, which the links are here, and I'm sure they've been, they've been sent out as well on the GitHub and PyP installs of this code. Um, and the Docker Hub version, I was thinking we could do a demo at the 11 o'clock session if, uh, if any of you all would find that useful. Um, this very subtle differences between these three things are namely in the GitHub and PyP installs. 
uh, the user needs to do some setup to run the code, uh, namely assigning these environment variables and ensuring that the dependencies and executables are present on that on their local machine. Christine has been working on a script, I think it's install underscore exe, that's automating much of this for the user. Um, and that's, I think, continually being uh, tuned to try to cover as many of these uh, sort of edge cases as possible. In the, deploy in the container side, uh, on, upon deployment, these dependencies and variables will all be set within the container. Um, the container is container and Docker, or, or Docker is a it's like Kleenex. It's a uh, specific brand of container. So sorry if we inter interuse those words. Um, we've mounted the one volume in the Docker run command that's in the repository. We've mounted the one volume we believe you would want to persist for future analysis. It'll include the uh, SNR files and the outputs of GNSSIR. Um, and this uh, volume includes the quick look images, which would other in the GitHub or PyP version would be printed to the screen. So that's like the main, the, the subtle differences between them. Uh, next slide. And so just really briefly, because this is generally the point of the homeworks and the will then be what's discussed at length in the 21st, but just wanted to paint the, the broad strokes of what GNSS refold could be, the sort of general workflows that at least from we interpret, especially related to the homeworks. The first is one of discovery, where if you are trying to gather a sense of the capability of a station to do GNSS IR, um, we strongly encourage you to look at use the web app, Christine's web app at gnssreflections.org. There are a lot of tools to get you started. Um, and then also using GNSS Refold, the Ryanx to SNR to quick look is a way that you can create, um, well, here, I should just say this, this the uh, time series plot here is, well, can come out of the web app or Quick Look, I guess Quick Look is running in the web app. So they are, those are two ways that you could create this plot. And then the figure on the right is a screenshot from the web app. Um, and the part that's of interest is from a discovery perspective are things like you can see this map view of where the reflection Fresnel zones are. So you can start to get a sense in your discovery of whether a site would have valid reflections over the water, potentially. Um, I'm just going to interrupt you. So uh, you inadvertently, you put some metrics for a different station than the picture. Mm -hmm. So the one at left is uh, the metrics, the one with all the dots. That's for a site in Greenland on an ice sheet. And the very top plot that has all the blue and the gray dots is uh, for a site in Greenland. And then the um, Thing you have on the right is for a sea level site in Alaska. So if people were trying to push those together, don't. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, they so, were just, I was just presenting these I, at I, like I, a... I get it. It's the representative. And so I think what um, Tim has said is 100% correct. The discovery part is a big part of this class. I really like you to understand what the method can and can't do. And some of the best ways to learn that is to try it out with ex existing data. Some of you will want to try it on your own data, but I think you gain confidence by using sites where we know it works and you learn things from that. And one of the ways you learn is to get back some kind of ideas of metrics where, wow, at this site in Greenland where there are no buildings, roads, or people, you can get reflections in all azimuths. But for example, this one that um, Tim is showing to the right, it's on a little peninsula. In Alaska, you're only going to be able to get reflections where there's water, right? And so you'll get you'll see a different pattern to your reflection metrics. Um, the other comment I will make is the web app is a stripped. Um, I'm not sure. We have a lot of non-native uh, uh, English speakers online, so I um, I'm not sure a stripped version makes much sense. Um, the web app 
is a simplified version of the Python code. It's, it only works on certain archives. So it only uses data from UNAVCO, SONAL, and uh, SOPAC. It only uses GPS, whereas the version I'm asking you to install for the class is, includes Beidou, Galileo, and GLONASS. And the other restriction to the web app is it is only, it's restricted to low rate DNSS data, so 15 or 30 second data. And that's really because it's a reflectometry on demand. When you start using high rate data, you take more CPU and um, this is a free website or it's a commercial website where I have to pay. And uh, I don't have unlimited amounts of space or time on it. So I had to make some decisions to make it run faster. Uh, so you should look at it as it's complementary to the class software. If you can solve your problem using the web app, you are welcome to use it. I think it's a great tool if you know. So for example, this site in Greenland, you can do it completely on the web app. You don't need to install the software, but if you wanna use multi-GNSS or use some of your own sites, um, you will wanna install the software. And, and Tim is right, it does the Rhinex conversion and it does quick look and it saves the answers for you. So it kind of does it all, but restricted. Only GPS signals, only certain archives. Okay, I just wanted to point out that the metrics here are um, not 100% consistent. Thanks, Christine. Um, and yeah, just the next slide, Kelly. These Again, these are just the very broad strokes. We're gonna go, this will be the the meat of the next course on the 21st. The other primary application here is for doing real analysis. So if you want to generate time series of valid reflector heights, valid being key there, as Christine mentioned, because there's a whole, um, you can get a lot of answers, but you have to be able to work through which ones are usable reflections and which ones aren't. And there's uh, lots of tools in the software to help you with that. And I, I encourage you all to check out, you know, this is sort of a hint for your homeworks. I encourage you all to check out, there are a number of use cases as well in the, both in the GitHub repo and in the notebooks that kind of walk you through some of these concepts of discovery and processing. Um, and this is that GL site, just for reference, this is that site GLS1 with a, a time series of valid reflections that are, I think this is using the weekly option. So it's once a week. Next slide. Um, just in advance, we're towards the end of this presentation, but the, to date, the primary errors that we've it's seen so far in uh, people installing their code largely relate to these few things. One being the system dependencies. So this is um, a couple of you have gotten an error. I think that often presents as like a PEP 517, which is related to that um, those Fortran wrapped code that requires certain libraries in your uh, operating system. We've covered in the in the uh, both in the in both versions of the, in the repository, we include we have uh, you know instructions on how to address that, um, but that's something that's come up. Uh, Python three is required. This has come up a few times. Um, the environment variables need to be set correctly. Uh, the executables need to be installed and installed. It, uh, within the, that correct directory, um, the main one being that uh, CRX to Rhinex, which is unpacking the Hanaka compressed Rhinex. And finally, we've had a lot of, or a number of issues related to these archive protocols and access. This one we found to be particularly tricky because many times it seems very user dependent, specifically related to the users um, you know, whatever network or firewall they may be behind. Um, and 
that combined with the fact, and I, I say this as someone I work at UNAVCO, UNAVCO operates an archive. Archives are in this sort of no, sort of no person's land of migrating from anonymous, many are migrating from anonymous FTP to some sort of um, authenticated HTTPS. And many archives are in different places in that process. And so, uh, you know, we're continually trying to keep up with that. But um, that being said, things are changing. And when things stop working, you know, like we said before, let us know. And if it's, it may be something unique to your connection, or it may be something dependent on the archive as they change. So we're just, again, just try to work with us and we appreciate all the feedback. Um, I just want to make a comment. Um, so I work at home, as so many of us do <laughs> now. Um, and uh, I get blocked by archives all the time. And it's not the archive. And it's uh, my, I have to run a VPN from my local university. So it's my, it's my home's internet connection. They, they, I don't know, they're, you know, so I will just put that out there as it's frustrating when these archive downloads fail because you don't know, is it the code's fault? Is, is it my fault? And, uh, and, you know, I turn on the VPN so that I'm going through the University of Colorado and all of a sudden everything works. Okay, that suggests it's my fault. <laughs> you know, my internet's fault, right? And I don't know what it is. And I also have a cloud account where I run Ubuntu. So I work on a Mac, you know, I use my home's internet. And then I have an Ubuntu account on a cloud account. And one day I couldn't, uh, one out of every three archive downloads was slow. And, and I spent hours trying to figure out what was wrong with the code. And it worked again the next day with no changes to the code. So I just have to assume there was something wrong at my cloud account that day. So unfortunately, I, I, although, well, I guess my point is I feel your pain if you're having problems with these archive downloads. Um, I don't think I, we have solutions for all of them, but um, I think I encourage you to try different avenues like I did, like, oh, I'll try a VPN maybe that'll work, or I'm gonna give up, I'll try again tomorrow, also works sometimes. <laughs> I'm not saying always. And then your other option is to talk to Tim and Kelly. We also did have a, uh, we found out that, um, should we out who did it, Tim? I don't know. A certain large archive was blocking a certain university in a certain country in Europe. And we didn't know that, right? So but we were able to fix it because people let us know. So I was convinced UNAVCO was personally blocking my access to their site, but they said no, but <laughs> I finally discovered it was my own internet service provider. Didn't like that I was downloading these large GPS files. I don't know why they would think that was suspicious activity, but there you go. Thanks, Christine. Yeah, and so in summary there, without getting too down in the weeds, we really, again, recommend using the Slack as much as you can. And I think we'll, one, you know, Kelly and Christine and I hope to um, sort of reduce all, like after all this, hopefully use all those Slack messages to try to build up a sort of uh, another README page of common errors. But until then, I would, I think your best bet is to use uh, your fellow students and the comments that have taken place within the Slack. And if you're not a Slack user, I guess um, send us a message. So, uh, next slide. So that's that's it for the, for now. Um, there's a lot of links on here. Again, we'll post this. That wasn't this isn't meant for someone just to have to read through or take a screenshot. We'll we'll post these in the. Um, so that you all can access these if you haven't already. Um, but Kelly, I don't know if you have any other words, but we're uh, that's that's we're just excited. So yeah, thank you all for joining. We really appreciate you being here. Um, if you do have questions, again, feel free to reach out. 
Um, feel free to wait for the times also that we have set aside. Maybe I'll go back to the schedule of slides so you all can see it. Um, but also if you have questions now, we're happy to answer. And again, I think it's also nice having some of these times a little bit later so that if you haven't had a chance to try to install the code that you can and then still have help from us personally. So um, I was just going to say, um, uh, Kelly and Tim, since people haven't raised their hand yet, uh, Kelly and Tim and I were talking about on October 21st that we would entertain um, Sort of what did we call them? I don't know. Um, if you have an idea for a site, uh, so if you have a Rhinox file, for example, where you think that might be a good reflection site, if you let us know in advance, we can try to um, tell you what we think about that site. Uh, of course, we encourage you to try it out on your own, uh, but we could also talk to you about the do's and don'ts for your own site. Uh, right now we're using ones from the archives, but um, because it gives you the opportunity to have time series produced pretty quickly, but you can also look at your own data if you have it. Um, I didn't say, but the web app does allow you to submit Rhinex files. So you can actually use it for your own data as well. Although I will remind you, it has to be a valid Rhinex file. And that means it has to be named properly and it has to have receiver coordinates in it and it has to have SNR data in it. So I think I talk about that in my GPS lingo video, but there are these minimum requirements for both the code and the web app. And I realize not everybody follows these protocols. So I guess you can think about these as being reflectometry requirements rather than general Rhinex requirements. Neil has a, I think it's a suggestion in the chat, which is would he suggests switching to a home network to a different DNS provider like Cloudflare using DNS over TLS or DNS over HTTPS. So that's, if you've uh, had success doing that, Neil, that's, we appreciate that feedback. And maybe we'll, if we get some other users that get some of those um, w I'm not, or whatever protocol error, uh, the download errors, we can try some things like that. So. Um, the other, another thing I could point out is I, I think we made CRX to RNX a required executable, uh, and it, it's in the builds that Kelly and Tim put together for the Docker images. Um, and we suggested a recommended tech and GFZ Rhinex. But I will warn you that if you want to do multi-GNSS and take advantage of Rhinex 3, you absolutely have to install GFZ Rhinex. You have to. And also, if you want to do sort of what I would call advanced reflectometry using high rate data and things like that, you have to install tech. Uh, the code just doesn't have enough, you know, I don't have. Rhinex merging capabilities of my own, and I don't read Rhinex 3. So I need those other tools to uh, manipulate those files, and, that, and that's why. Because uh, otherwise, we're just reinventing the wheel. And uh, so we rely on the work of these uh, organizations that have made these tools available. And I just, for one, especially to GFZ, a big thank you for making that GFZ Rhinex tool available. Tech is, uh, what's the right word for tech, Tim? No, no longer supported? Is that? End of life. End of life? <laughs> but it still works. And if someone has given you 96 individual Rhinex files, because they've given you 15 minute Rhinex files, it's helpful if somebody else merges those for you. <laughs> so, uh, that's why we rely on those tools. There, there's, a, there's still a little bit of a tension, for example, for the Australians, if there are any Australians online, I can't imagine they're watching this live, but 
you know, the archives are changing. They're changing from RINEX2 to RINEX3. They're changing from Z compression to GZIP. I mean, it's, it's a, like a parade of changes and it's been hard to keep up with them. So we try, but we do have to rely on these other executables to allow us to bring this software to you with more options. And so I realize it's a little bit of a pain, but just keep it, keep in mind that we do it so that we can do more things for you in the, the software itself. We can look at more applications. We can look at more, uh, for example, the high rate data lets us look at higher uh, sites, things like that. And this is Neil Wynn again, if I could ask a question. Of course. Um, so I am doing two or attempting to do two things. I'm trying to learn how this whole process works, which I just am super thrilled about. Um, and I'm trying to make a plan for the future of a what will hopefully be a network uh, for the National Park Service that helps to monitor water level where we can. Um, and we'll be having uh, what, what we what we currently have is a Trimble pivot in trip instance that'll eventually be storing files in the cloud and whatever format doesn't really matter. Um, I'm assuming and I might be getting way ahead of myself and please tell me if I am but I could request that our cloud people um, create a service that uses your code that could potentially be automated to give uh, reflectometry based water levels in parks. Does that seem like a reasonable statement based on what you've got going? Are you interested in tides or are you interested in daily levels? Which one? For the most part, it's tides. Uh, that's the biggest concern, especially along the East Coast. And do you want them in real time or are you willing to wait an hour or a day? Um, I always want real time, but really what we need is long term monitoring. Um, but real time would be ideal ish. Recognizing okay, like, but are you a, like a, a seismologist real time or a geodesist real time? <laughs> I mean, is real time within seconds or real time within uh, 15 minutes? Uh, considering maybe real time where a, let's, the hypothetical scenario is a hurricane is hitting, and it would be really cool if everything is still alive that uh, whatever that water level is or has been within the last, similar to how a current tide gauge works. Okay. Um, so the answer is yes, this code could be configured to do that. I did a quick and dirty install uh, on my cloud account because uh, I can't have my Macintosh running all the time doing this stuff. But I, I got a cloud account and I set it up so that it would update itself. I think I might have done hourly just because, you know, that was how often the files were being updated. Uh, if you're streaming and an end trip would be streaming, what you'd want to do is change it so that obviously it updated more often. Um, uh, you know, there's a couple different ways you could go forward with this. One is you could use your own Python install to do that, right? Um, you're, you're working with people that are going to make files available to you, right? So you could pick up the files and compute those title values yourself. Does that make sense? Neil? I lost you, I think. Can yes, you guys Sorry, okay. stuff crashed, lost internet connection, so sorry. Oh, um, well, I was just gonna say there's two things you could do. One is <clears throat> I've done a demo of that just for my, well, just because I was locked in my house like everybody else. So I sort of did it for fun. Um, yes, you can use the current code to do something like that. You just have to iterate, right? You have to update it repeatedly, <clears throat> but it won't do something within seconds because I haven't set it up to be that smart. Uh, the second thing is you could ping the web app right? You, you, it's an API. You could just call the web app. Uh, the question is, how do, what would be the smartest way to do it? And that would depend on how you're storing the data in the cloud, right? So it sounds like you're setting up a cloud server. So you could ask those same people to call an API, right? 
Right. So you could get you could eliminate the middleman. We you could, could but I have a strong uh, expectation that we will need um, full GNSS capability, especially in the Alaska sites and anywhere that has a place pointing north. Um, yeah. And I, I think that some of our sites will need that. Yeah. So, OK. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And the problem with multi GNSS is not the it's not GNSS isn't the problem so much as the source, it's getting the orbits. And I, I, for that, you need real-time orbits. And the nice thing about the GPS system for me is I have code that I wrote over the years to do nav orbits. So it's, it was easy to put it online. I don't have that for GLONASS and Galileo. And that's why we use SP3 files, which are precise orbits. I forgot to put this in one of my videos, but the reason we use precise orbits is not because we need precise orbits. We don't. Uh, the problem is I need a source for those orbits and SP3 files is a, a convenient way to get them. And they're not available in real time. I don't believe that GFZ orbits we use now are, they're available really quickly, but I don't think they're in real time. Uh, so, uh, what is your time? I guess what is your time scale for getting all this stuff going in a year or something, or six months, or? Well, so we we have a bunch of GNSS receivers that came from the Coast Guard for a system they had running for a long time, and we yeah. played to upgrade those receivers to multi frequency and all that scenario. Right. We have we're rolling out our first phase of it, which was just precision uh, navigation and measurement sure. and stuff like that. Sure. The sure. second phase starts next year. We'll have some money to do some installations, okay. and it'll okay. cost a little more. But it could take years, and that's yeah. fine. Um, sure, so sure. if we, I'm I'm anticipating what we need to do is collect data, and then we can figure out the analysis later, and then we can turn it into real time if we can. Yeah, I mean, I, I I'm. I, I like this idea. I mean, I, I'm already thinking how to, you know, it'd be nice if NTRIP would produce something that we could use immediately into the code that would help. It, it doesn't exist right now, but it's the kind of thing that could happen. Um, so uh, I, I think the short answer is yes, it can be done. It sounds like it'll require some effort. So we'll have to think about that. What's the best way forward? Um, I think the main thing, and you and I have talked offline, is to put in good sites. And that should be the main focus, the first good focus. And then after that, you, we can work on ways to get the software to do what you need. I do have a colleague in Great Britain who is working on real time, uh, near real time. And so uh, we can try to talk to him about smart ways to do that. He's a little bit ahead of me in that regard. And, uh, and he's a good colleague. And we can certainly talk to him about ways to go forward. Excellent. Thank you very much. Sorry for hijacking the conversation. No, it's all, it's all right, because I see Antonio, he's also interested in <laughs> real time. I think that's where everybody goes. And I will have to say, as someone who's looked at the Gulf data, there, were, there are GPS sites run by Louisiana State or the Louisiana Corps, and they're great sites. Uh, but, you know, they're on NTRIP and it would be easier to just pick up those streams than to have to download the Rhinex and translate the Rhinex. It's, it's really, it, it would be more useful if we could just go straight to those streams and uh, produce something uh, rapidly. That's what I, I think that's what everybody wants. And there's also the expectation that you can go back later, a day later, and, and maybe it'll get in the same it could possibly become the way now. Uh, those of us in the geodetic community, they're the rapid products, right? And then, then, then there's the final products. I mean, we, you know, we, I think we all agree that the rapid won't be as good as the final, but we allow both to exist. And at some point you only use the precise. So those of you who know Jeff Blewett, you know that he has the last two weeks are in a separate file than um, the final. Right, so he might have a decade of answers, and then he's got rapid results for the last two weeks or something like that. But I, I would also say I, I think there are people on the line here uh, that are doing cryosphere stuff, and they pick up their data once a year, right? So they need, and, and by then we all know the orbits, and they can just go zooming through all their data in. 15 minutes, you know, they can analyze a year of data in 15 minutes. 
And right now we have one code that does both those things. So to do the real time, we want to put a wrapper that kind of takes advantage of the models we have, but still allows the cryosphere people to go through their data in a timely way without having to worry about all this mTRIP stuff, because they're not going to have that. Um, and as Joe Hatton said something about predicted orbits, predicted orbits for multi-GNSS isn't a thing. I, it is true that there are nav orbits for, for Galileo and, and GLONASS, and would someone please write a reader and an orbit predictor for me in Python? And I will install them in my code. But I'm getting pretty old to write nav predictors, and I'm tired. <laughs> I did the SP3 files. If someone would read Galileo and GLONASS nav files for me and do the orbit calculation, I will add it to GNSS Reflect, which I agree doesn't have a doesn't have vowels in it and makes it hard to pronounce. But does that make sense to you guys? I re really would need help with that. Oh. Ellen, I think we know the answer to your question. Someone else had the same problem, so we'll get back to you. I saw a question about wget. I know that somebody else- Yeah, wrote. Christine, I'm having problems with that and I'm not entirely sure what's going on. <laughs> yeah, it's some weirdo thing that Kelly can help you with, right, Kelly? Because it's the same thing that Rowena had. Um, you... I'm not sure if her said that she had w get already but um she ended up having to go into the code and actually hard wire no but i'm just saying we've oh. seen this error with the w yeah so it would be helpful to know um which installation you're going through and then what step you're on when you're when but you're i i think system. that should be in one of the um whatever we call these what are these little things where you guys the go off channels yeah, but whatever you're the, uh, the 10 o'clock or I guess it is getting close to 10 o'clock or the 11 o'clock or yeah, it depends which build you're using uh, in terms of solving that. I was I was just doing it on the in command line, Python command line. Right, um, okay. And so yeah, it came up when I went to install the executables and I had a message pop up that says, oh, you don't have wget, but then it looks like it installed everything. But then when I and if I look in my environment, it claims that I have wget, but I don't have um, the orbits files. And I'm assuming that is related to the fact that like, I don't actually have wget installed somewhere. Well, this is where I'm gonna dump it on Kelly and Tim. <laughs> so, uh, because there are different, you know, interpretations of what you said. So a lot of it always has to do with exactly what's flying into your screen. And so I will not attempt to answer that. Are there any more questions for me before I um, log off? Questions about the, I don't know. I, if you I have comments about the videos, you can send those to me, I guess, separately. But I, I think uh, I definitely forgot to say you needed G4Tran GCC when I made the install videos. I just. Sometimes your computer has things on it and you forget. Uh, that would be my defense. Uh, Hello, um, I have a question. This is Lynn from BKG. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, actually, regarding on the orbits, I would like to know uh, what's the uh, what the accuracy requirement of the of the orbit, or let's say in terms of predicting orbits. I only mm. need say a couple meter orbits. So nav orbits is fine. Nav, I mean, I'm not even sure I need multiple meters. So nav quality is fine. I don't need precise. The only reason we use the orbits are to get the elevation angle and the azimuth angle, and it doesn't have to be that good. It's not geodesy. Okay. It's really just, yeah. So for me, I would be happy to use nav orbits, navigation quality orbits for Galileo, GLONASS, and Beidou. I just, and I know those files exist, but I don't want to code it up. So if you know somebody else who's already done Python orbit propagation for GLONASS, Galileo, NAV orbits, just point me to it and I, I will try to use it. 
And you also don't need the receiver coordinates to be very good inside your file. They don't have to be centimeter either, right? Nav quality. Okay, I see. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Hi, Christine. Can I ask one doubt? Uh, sure. Yeah, actually, uh, I was using this, uh, the code that was given by you, and uh, somehow I'm getting the plots and all of that, but it is, it is not showing. My plot is not generating. Uh, it is not a good plot. So I had a doubt that whether, because we use chokering antenna, that is the geodetic antenna. So is it like there is any specification that we have to change the antenna setup or it has to be a different antenna setup so that it is not going to negate or it is not going to subtract the reflected signals because chokering antenna is specifically done to negate those signals. So I'm. Uh, are you, so you're saying you did your own experiment and yeah. you your own antenna? Just two, three months, uh, seeing your page through that, whatever you have given before the course, short course started, before that I was trying it. But somehow I did not, the plots were not good. And I doubted that because of the antenna, because our antenna, which we use is basically chokering antenna. So is it an issue if we use a chokering antenna? No, that it is not no. almost every, every, almost every use case on the software uses a chokering. So there are lots of things that could be wrong. Um, I think um, the best solution would be to send a Rhinex file to Tim okay. and Kelly uh, and well, I guess you could send it to me, but I think it'd be useful if we have it centralized somehow. Okay. Maybe it'd just be best to send it to me. So send me a Rhinex file and a photograph of your site. Okay, okay. okay and I'll, sure. I'll look at it for you. Um, and because you said something really important, you said the plots didn't look good. That's that's exactly what I want you to learn from this class is why aren't they looking good? And it could be that your site's too far from the shore. It could be, are you trying to do water? Are you trying to do tides? No, I'm snow, uh, snow depth retriever. Snow depth, okay. The surface could be too rough. You could be too close to the snow. Um, I don't know, is this a, a where, which, where is the, what country are the, are the data uh, being collected in? India and near Himalayas, near Karakuram Fault. Yeah, so I tried over the years to measure snow in India and I always failed because the sites were too small. I mean, they were rough. I mean, they, you know, they didn't have large planar areas. Uh, it, you, so I'd need to see if, I, it would be helpful to see a photograph of the site and to look oh. at the data file. It's not the antenna. I would almost bet money. Okay, okay, okay. So I have failed myself to measure snow depth in many mountainous regions. And it's because people tend to put the GPS sites in these little, you know, surrounded by rocks and it's rough yeah. and trees and they're, yeah. you know, and it's just not the right technique for those kinds of areas. Uh, we need a sort of a large open field Okay. Flat, relatively flat, uh, planar, and it works great. And that's why it works so well in many on many ice sheets. But we also used it at like 150 sites in the Western US. Okay. You know, it doesn't work everywhere. I tried it some places where it worked very poorly, but I found many sites would work. It really just depends what your site looks like. Okay. And, um, that that's probably the easiest way is you sent sent me a photograph and a Rhinex file. I think we could answer the question pretty quickly. Sure, I'll I'll do that. I'll do that. I mean, because it is a it's a forward it's a forward reflection. You know how radar is doing backscatter? We're doing forward scatter. So yeah, you, yeah. Right, and so if the surface isn't relatively smooth, there's no forward scatter. So, um, and this is why when, uh, when it's very windy, a lot of water reflections fail. So you'll have a good tide gauge site. And then if it's extremely windy, you'll all of a sudden you'll lose your reflections and you're going, what's going on? This used to be a good site. Well, uh, you know, <laughs> 100 mile an hour winds 
will make for a rough uh, water surface. So uh, one of the points of our tsunami paper was to point out, look, we can track during this hurricane up to about, I can't remember, it was like 30 miles an hour or something. And then we lose it. And then since the eye of the hurricane went through where our site was, there was a time when the wind speed went to zero because the eye of the hurricane went right over the GPS site. So that was kind of cool. But if you want, uh, you, you, you shouldn't deploy them with the assumption it'll work at high wind speeds, extremely high wind speeds, it won't work. And similarly, many mountainous areas, depending on how your site was set up, won't work either. Not all of them, but some of them won't work. Okay, sure, I, I'll send, send you the plots. I don't want to see your plots. I want to okay. see a photograph and okay. a running file. Okay, sure, yeah. I, I, I don't want to see your data plots because okay. in some ways, what it's good is I can look at it independently, right? And then that gives me an idea you know, by both of us looking at data, data separately, I think we'll come up with different ideas. So it's good that you looked at it first because that gives you some feedback. It's failing, why? And then I would look at the same data and maybe have a different idea. So I would look at it independently. Sure, okay. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Will we spend some time on the 21st Talking about good site selection and characteristics, yes. And uh, But I made a video where I talked a little bit about that already. Of course, it's not sufficient, but it was it's a start. It's, it, I think it's mainly oriented toward the people that are doing sea level. But the questions about measuring snow are also good ones. And so I will cover that as well. Uh, why isn't it working at this site in India? Why is it working better in this site in Canada? things like that. Um, I'm happy to cover that as well. I, I can assure you, I have failed to measure reflections many, many times. It, it is just, you have to look at it as a glass half full or half empty. So you can, does that make sense? You, you know, it works some places and the, the goal is for you to know where it works and where it doesn't work. And in places it doesn't work, just don't work there with this technique, as long as you understand why it doesn't work, in my opinion. But I, I think we went past the 10 o'clock, so maybe I should be quiet. Yeah, so I was gonna say, unless, well, at this point too, anybody that, I think we'll try to transition to this next phase here, which is, focused on the Jupyter Notebook installation. Um, if you have any more questions, general questions, throw them in Slack or email us, or uh, if they're related to these topics coming up at 10, 11, 12, just uh, jump on the Zoom. And anyone else that doesn't have any more questions or uh, is, you know, feel free to leave or, you know. So we're just going to cap you this You don't have at this to point. sit the whole time through the hour. You can come back during that time when you might have a question as well. So. Um, so yeah, it'll just be pretty open at this point for, um, we'll start right, you know, in a minute here with the notebook installation. Um, and yeah, people feel free to come and go. So there's no, no expectation that you all will be here, so. So yeah, with, with that, I guess, thank you all. And um, if anybody, I see, we can just, right now we'll move into the notebooks. I saw that, is it Ruben says that they have the Jupiter running homework zero and will that, well, does that mean they won't have issues in the future? Um, that I would say that the, goal of homework zero is this sort of first order test of whether your code is installed and working. So generally the answer is we hope so, uh, but there doesn't, we don't guarantee that there may still be some issues. So, but, uh, but yeah, thank you for that feedback.
Kelly, did you, for the notebooks, um, did, did you want to do anything else to sort of kick things off here or just go right into more questions? Um, I'm hoping for more questions. If anyone wants me to go through how to install again, if there's any confusion there or if anyone is experiencing errors with installation, just let me know. Uh, hello? Hi. Yeah, I just joined in the middle of last session and mm -hmm. I would like, I already installed, uh, I clone the the Genesis Rev. And I would like, if, it would be nice if you just show us uh, or repeat the installation pro steps for that. Sure. Yeah, so, thank you. Um, I, you said that you cloned the GNSS RFL. Did you clone the, um, the, the command? Do you know if you cloned the command line version or the Jupyter from GitLab? From GitHub, yeah. OK, um, so that would be the command line version. I don't know. Are you interested in, in running it in a Jupyter notebook? I can go over how to do that again. OK. No. Sure. Just a sec. So I'm going to post this in the chat for you. So that's the link for the repository for the Jupyter Notebooks. And um, are you comfortable using Docker? Do you have that installed on your computer? Would you like to use your own Python version? Yeah, it's my first time with this, so it could sure. be fine if just the easiest one for me would be, would be okay, better. Okay, yeah. The, so the easiest one, if you go to that, the, the first instructions would be to install Docker, but I'll also, what um, system are you running? Are you on a, a Mac or a Linux? Yeah, Linux. Linux, okay. All right, I just posted in the chat the Docker installation instruction or link. And let me know if you get that running. And just um, while in the middle there, Kelly, if you all have mm -hmm. if other, just so we can kind of get a gauge with where everyone's at with this, if you have. I guess it would be really helpful to post any questions in the chat or I guess raise your hand if you have something just so we can start to gauge how to manage the next what could be up to an hour. Um, just for your in the interest of primarily your all's time. So. Yeah, and, and to answer the question in the chat, are the instructions posted somewhere? They are posted on the, the GitLab and the GitHub, which is also on the course page. You can find those links there. And once you go to those pages, they all have instructions on how to install. Okay, um, Kelly, are you, I see, I think it's, is it Demon has his, has their hand up? Uh, yes, <clears throat> thank you so much. First of all, uh, this is a very nice session. Uh, I think very, it's very useful. So I am actually, you know, I have a specific question. So I, I am trying to use the you know, Jupyter version of it and mm -hmm. I believe I installed it correctly, given that, you know, there is no error. <laughs> so, 
So still when I'm running, in, in, uh, I'm on step four where it says run a uh, quick analysis. And when I run uh, this command here, it says run genesis ref dot rhinox2 SNR. And it gives me error. It says that uh, run rhinox2 SNR got an unexpected keyword uh, keyword argument translator. Right. So I'm not sure if you guys can help me with does that. It, does it say what that keyword is? Do you want me to oh, uh, translator? I translator. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want okay. me to share the screen? Yeah, um, sure. It, mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's see what... Just give me a second. So I... Okay, see my screen. Mm -hmm. Rothy's believes there's a better way to make shoes. Oh, so, yeah, so it's in on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see that. That's interesting. Um, so sometimes we do, um, or Christine, when she is writing her code. So, pretty much what this run GNSS REFL does, it kind of wraps her code um, into a, a friendly version that's workable for the Jupyter Notebooks. And when she makes changes to some of the, um, uh, the default parameters, this can happen. Um, if you have the most, so uh, did you um, install this code today or did you do this? I just installed it just uh, a few moments ago, yeah. Okay, let me see if so I'm going to do the same thing. I'll go back a little bit. So, yeah. it, you know, paths are, I believe it's correct. You know, got CNN, CNR to Rhinox. And mm -hmm. this is the first code, I guess, from this package. Yeah, let me let me just think about the best way to 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 solve this. Um, I'm gonna see if I get the same error as well, um, because this would be something that if if Christine did change something in our code, this error would happen. This is on homework zero. All right, thanks. Uh -huh. And are you using the, the Docker version or is this on your local? Uh, this is on my local machine. Okay. Um, could you go ahead and um, are you in a virtual environment? I am on what? A virtual environment in your in your terminal. So in your terminal, when you went to um, install the requirements.txt, yeah. you have the instructions. So if you um, go back to the terminal and then can you try to pip install GNSS REFL or pip uninstall and then reinstall it and then see if you get the same error. Okay, that will take a few minutes. All right, sure. Let me just close this. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, and we've also had, um, for Francesca, I hope that's how you say your name, um, we have had some errors with finding orbit files. Um, Tim, I don't know, what was our solution for the last person that had an orbit file error? Did they have to download it directly? It's in the Zoom chat. Yeah, I think that I was just going to confirm, but typically, because those that error is saying that the files don't exist, this, but the files do exist. So oftentimes that's related to these. Um, I think a lot of them have been that people have had issues with secure FTP. Uh, so I think the CDIS archive is FTPS. Um, and so we, Christine has added a way to get those using the download orbits function, which I don't think is in the notebook yet. Um, yeah, that, that will be worked into the notebooks, but it isn't there yet. So the short answer, Francesca, is I that's my intuition, but we can, uh, right now I was just trying to see if I could recreate the problem first, just to make sure it's not something in the code specifically, because I, like I said, uh, our previous experience has been these are sort of dependent maybe uh, users sort of network issues type things. So if we can narrow it to that, then we can try to help you out from there. Uh, hi. Yeah, I, I also tried with the VPN of work, but I, I got the same issue. Didn't work. Uh, so. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, having having uh, this many people in, install the code is, has been very helpful for us to see what some of the issues are, but some of the solutions are still forthcoming. So, um, yeah, we'll try to get back to you during this session. Um, okay, we'll, okay. We'll get to some of these. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I uh, re so this is the one again. So I reinstalled mm -hmm. that. It, uh, it gives me the same, same error. When you reinstall it? Oh, it gives you the same uh, error. Yeah, after, after reinstalling, yeah. OK, um, so Could you um, share your screen again for that for that error? Sure. Okay, so I don't I um I don't think that this is happening on on mine, but I, I can help you specifically with with yours um, mm -hmm. by kind of doing a, a quick fix. So um, if you go back to the home page outside of this notebook, are you able to do that? Page. Yeah, like the page that opened up when you open the notebooks. Um, that had the directories in it where the notebooks were. I see. That makes sense. So I directly opened the notebook. This, this yeah. Specifically. Oh. Yeah. So I'd have to. Okay. Um, it should work if you um in the browser just delete the where the short course homework zero is. It should it should take you where the notebook directory is. Yes, yes. Let me just let me just uh, close this. Sorry. Yeah, no problem.
So you meant this, right? Mm -hmm. Um. So click on the little folder um, at the top, the little blue folder up above. Yeah. 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 Oh. Hmm. Or just because that I opened it from this directory, do you want me to open it from the? Yeah, can you open it from from the main directory? Um, I'm okay. All of it. Yeah. I'm just gonna have you go into the run GNSS RFL and remove the translator option and see if that helps. I see. It's a quick fix. I will get back to you with an actual fix, but for now, to get you running, sure. that may work. Great. Okay, so go into the bin. Bin. And run GNSF. Yeah, RFO. And then, so this is the first definition, the run right next to SNR. So scroll down to the bottom of that definition. Pretty close. Yeah, I think oh, up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, so down at the, the bottom there where it's um, passing in a, a, let's see, where are we? Um, Up a little bit? Sorry. All right, yeah. Yeah, I'm right there. So you see where it says translator and it's passing in the translator? Just remove that section. The section? Yeah. This may not work, so <laughs> we're just going to try it. All right. And then save that and now go back to the notebook and, and try to run it. Um, and you'll have to run through the first lines again to re-import. Yeah, so um, I think that what's happening is somehow you have an older version of um, GNSSR REFL, and I'm not sure why. Um, oh, just because that I have, that's probably, yeah, I have. It seems like it's complaining about some of the, um, some of the extra parameters that have been added more recently. Oh, okay. So that... I think that explains. So I have a terminal version installed here, which I've, I've been running in past days. So that means that I would have to remove them, I guess. Yeah, I would try that. All right, so I will <laughs> report it back. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> later then, All right, I'll probably. Okay. Yeah, know, let me know how that goes. Yeah, it will take some time. So I, I, I will, um, I will post, you know, post it on Slack when I. Perfect. Try. Okay. Great. Right. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Kelly, I think um, I'm still trying to kind of narrow Francesca's error, and then I noticed there's a couple more in the mm -hmm. chat. So uh, I think it looks like maybe Julia. Oh, it looks like Julia has a similar error to Francesca's. So, and it looks like, uh, is it Wim had some suggestion to check the uh, environment variables for Julia and Francesca? 
Yeah, so in, in the Jupyter Notebook, it does have, um, it sets the environment variables for you, but if they weren't set properly or in the place that um, you're maybe expecting them to be set, it should print them out for you. Um, so if you look back at those and they don't look like they're set well. Hear me? It's Julia here. Hi. Uh, hi. I, I am using Docker. And uh, for the first line, uh, without the GNSS, it works. And with the GNSS, uh, when I use the overwrite option, it doesn't work. I, um, I checked yesterday the um, environment variables, and they seem OK. But now I check uh, again. Thank you. So you're saying when you use the, the overwrite, that's when it fails? Yes, for me, yes. But uh, then when I run the other um, row, mm -hmm. it right. doesn't work. Uh, when you're grabbing in the, the GNSS orbit. Yeah, so un unfortunately, we have had several people have that issue. Um, let's see. Uh, so in the... I guess. Would you be but able I, to print out on um, the error or post the error in the in the Slack, maybe, or even here is fine. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it might I have be this more information. I have the error also when I use the year uh, uh, two thousand and twenty, and when I put the, the archive CDDIS. That is the four point C point of the homework zero. Mm -hmm. Kelly, do you, it might it'd be good to know whether it's for starters. I think do you know whether it's the navigation file or the Rhinox file that's failing? I think it's the trying to download the, the orbit file. At least it seems like that's what's been the issue for, for everyone else, or not everyone, but for other people. Sorry, this is Francesca again, just an update. Mm -hmm. So I tried the same command, but uh, removing the archive equals Hunapko option and now it works hmm. so, <laughs> at least i got success uh, snr file was creating yeah so um that's great that that worked it must have been something with that trying to access the unafco archive so the the code when it has the archive in there um it'll go specifically to that archive but if you don't put an archive it will search for one in many archives so okay. that is a good solution. If, if a certain archive isn't working for you, then the code will search for you to find it in many different ones. So I'm that's okay. good to hear. Good yeah, to it's know. worth Fran, Francesca, we should we yeah. can keep whether it's here or can, we could continue because it, it is a curious result that the UNAMCO archive wouldn't work. Obviously, we're biased here. We would like to be sure <laughs> yeah. for you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, we can keep debugging that. If not today, just uh, in the you know send us a message or Slack, and it may sometimes there's some logic in here too that it may be there's you know it could be a number of things. So okay, okay, great, thanks. Uh, I wonder if for was it Julia that had a similar problem, just trying that to start just to see if if it's the same issue, and then we can try to figure out what well, the issue is. Yeah, I think un unfortunately the problem with the with that section, the with it calling the orbit the GNSS orbit, it doesn't request a specific archive on that call. And just so you all are familiar too, if, it, if it's not already clear, these are all whether even in the in the container or if you're running it locally, these are. You know, you'll see there's directories with uh, 
the orbits so you can see if there's actually an orbit file being downloaded and then the Rhinex data goes, I'm trying to remember in the notebooks, it gets downloaded into, where is that stored, Kelly? It's in the... Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I was like thinking about this. You um, 20 things at once. <laughs> yeah, it, it's all stored. There's like the, the main directory that you open the Jupyter notebooks in and um, there will be an orbits directory and that's where the orbit files will be stored. Then there's going to be um, a, a year directory. So whatever year you're downloading, it'll look like year and then it'll have the station name in there. And then those will be separated um, by their other more directories. But um, once you're in there, that's where the Rhinex files will be stored in those year directories. So you'll know it by the year and the day and station. But I think that if if successful, right, as I recall, the uh, the, the Rhinex file itself will be deleted in that Rhinex to SNR. And I think that's done intentionally to preserve your all the space disk space, so you don't pile up a bunch of Rhinex files. Um, so the the SNR file will will um, exist in that 2020 directory. But if a successful translation takes place, the Rhinex file is removed. So, okay. Yeah, so it looks like it's an SSL certificate issue. So we have had this issue where CDDIS um has been timing out and not authorizing people to grab these orbit files i i think in this case probably in the interest of time um do we have the link tim do you have the link tim to where the where to get the orbit file manually yes i mean we can um there's a slack i think there was a thread that I can link to as well as the link to, I think um, those SP3, the GFZ SP3 files are also available via the IGN in France. And that's, that does not, that uses a different protocol currently. So that's why some people have been able to get those files there when they haven't been able to get them from CDDIS. And um, I think yeah, this is something from, from like an automated workflow thing for you all, all trying to do this with regular, you know, trying to do a long time series, for instance, we're going to have to figure out, you know, I think between now, or it's something we're working on with, within the code base itself. But in the short run, if it's just this one error, we can make sure you can get a file to keep doing the homeworks. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we did recently create what we're hoping is going to be a workaround for um, this issue. But again, I have not yet translated that to the Jupyter Notebook version. So yeah, in the um, interest of time, we'll give you a, the link and then you'll need to, and you are in the, the Docker, is that right? Yeah, 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 I am running Docker, yeah. Okay. Um, so I can, let's see, I'm trying to think of the best way uh, for you to get this file. So let me see if I can find the, the link again um, to download the file. So what you can do is then you'll download it on your local machine and then um, we'll put it in the files volume that we created so that we can get it into the, um, the container. And we may need to move it from there, but let's start with getting that. Uh, I have, a, I think I may have a problem here because it's, 
Uh, it's the first time I am uh, using uh, Docker and in my mm -hmm. local machine in the files uh, folder, I don't have anything. Is it correct uh, or? Yeah, that's okay, normal okay. for now. So once you get further into the process after running Rhinex to SNR, if you're able to run um, the quick look or the analysis, it will produce some files, which will then be saved there. But okay. um, at least we haven't been able to make it to that step yet. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. So let me see if I can get this um, link for you and then we will, I will help you move it into the container. Um, Kelly, you're just curious, the archive link? Yeah, yep. It's here's the, the I had it up the other day, but now it's gone. And the IGN link that's at FTP, I just put in the chat. And, um, and like I think we mentioned already, but um, this is a known or this has been experienced enough, I think, that we may, you know, I think Christine's in the process, she's added. To the command line, she's added a utility to go get them via this other archive. And I think we'll try to have that incorporated into the notebook soon. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we can figure out what the, if there is some correlation other than just some people aren't able <laughs> to access these. Um, are there any more, we can keep working with this one specific question, but I, you know, what, are there any, if there aren't any other questions, you all are, uh, no need to hang around except for maybe the folks that are, you know, we can keep, we can keep working with Julia, Francesca uh, on this one thing for a minute, um, or you're welcome to hang out. So. <laughs> it's just, you know everyone's time is very precious, so. Hi, Kelly and Tim. It's Brad here. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Brad. Hey, 
Um, I have just kind of a general question because I'm I'm really new to using Docker in general. Um, so I've I've had no problem so far with installing and running the notebook in Docker. That's fine. My question is, do I need to stop the Docker instance when I'm done working with the code and restart it later? Or is it okay to just kind of let it run, like let that instance run for however long I want it? Yeah, it is okay to let it run. Absolutely. Okay. Um, it, I, it's not a very large container. There's not much going on in it. So I don't think it would be very computationally intensive at all to keep it running. Okay. You can Great. stop it and start it again. If it does stop because something stops it, which I don't think it would, but if it does, then um, Docker start is how you would start that back up again. And if you are using the Docker desktop, again, which I do recommend if you start it and you don't have the link anymore, there are instructions on how to get that link again um, to get back into the container. And if okay. you're using the Docker desktop, you can just click on the container. And when you start it, the link will show up again at the bottom. Okay, I'm running in Ubuntu, so I don't think there is a Docker desktop. Huh, I thought I had, I saw some instructions for Linux. Oh, okay. Pull that up again. But otherwise I could just issue a command like docker stop and then GNSS ruffle Jupyter. Do I have to remove the image or just stop and start it? Stop and start. So you don't want to remove the image or the, you can remove the container. You can remove anything really. And then you can okay. just redownload it again, run that same command in the beginning. Um, if you did have anything you are working on in the container, that would then be lost, if that makes sense. But if right. you do have a volume and you saved everything you wanted on your local machine, that wouldn't be an issue. Okay, great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it's called Docker Engine for Linux. So I, I have this link, let me put it in the chat. And it does say um, Docker Desktop for Mac and Windows, but then it says also available for Windows and Linux. And if you click on the Linux part, it sends you to a Docker Hub. <laughs> So I may look more into that and I can get back to you to see if there is a Linux version for Docker desktop. Okay, thanks. I I found something on uh, on a different forum anyways that said that Docker is just kind of a native part of Ubuntu, so it doesn't a desktop it doesn't really need it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll look around a little further too. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. So, um, Julia, I, I would say um, just in the meantime, um, I'm going to work on getting this file for you and I can help you get it working. Um, um, I think the best would be maybe to wait until I can actually include the functionality in the in the notebooks, which will be I could do that today. Um, in the meantime, you will be able to finish the rest of the homeworks without needing, because um, I don't think we require you to use the GNSS orbits um, for the rest of the homework, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, I will try. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so you may be able to run through that and then I can contact you. Uh, you are on the Slack channel? Yeah, yeah, I am uh, here. Okay. I, can, I can report the error if uh, it is okay for you. Yeah, that'd be that'd be great. Yeah, and then okay. I'll, I'll contact you once that because I think it'd just be better to have the functionality there. Um, yeah, to get it to work for you than uh, having a, a quick workaround. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.
it looks like I might have lied in homework one. You do use that functionality. So <laughs> I'll, I'll work on getting that fixed and I'll message you when it is fixed and you should be able to then go, go through the rest of the homeworks. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions that we missed or that anyone else has at the moment? Well, if, if not, maybe we'll take five minutes before the next one. Uh, again, we really, we really appreciate appreciate your all's time and you all, you know, the interest in joining and feedback, and we're excited for this uh, main event on the twenty first. So. so yeah, Kelly, do you want to meet back at eleven? Yeah, that sounds great. All right. Well, thank you all. We're going to keep this. The Zoom will be running, but. Um, and if you want to come to the command line questions too, you're welcome. Well, it's, it's 11. Um, some of you, I think, have left and come back. Um, so I think, Kelly, if you're there, we could start with our command line office hours. I don't know if anyone's interested, or maybe we could start with a, if you, what do you think, Kelly, of like a really quick demo of the Docker, just for people that aren't familiar, because you might, some of these, what we found is a lot of these issues um, may be solved by using the Docker, not all of them, some of them. Um, so here I could just give you a quick, it would just take a second. You all see a terminal window? Yeah, I can see. Um, so if we were going to deploy the Docker here, um, it's really just as easy as, well, I, on this machine, I've already downloaded Docker, their instructions on how to do that. That's a key first step. Um, but get, assuming that Docker is on your system, uh, maybe I'd make a directory to do this in. Uh, and then I enter that directory. And now this will be like where I'm doing all my processing within the container, because as we'll see, if we run the Docker, I'll put the the docker run command, which is in the homework zero, um, as well as in the docker hub. Kelly spoke a little bit in the nine o'clock presentation about doing this with the notebook. And um, it's very similar logic from a docker perspective here. The main difference is instead of opening um, an interactive URL, we're going to open this in a interactive bash shell. So what this command is saying here is it's docker run. I'm the dash IT is saying it's an interactive shell. At the end, I have the bin bash. The dash V is what I'm doing here. It's mounting uh, a vault, the sort of, a local, it's basically mapping a local volume to the container. And this is so, as Kelly mentioned before, there are parts of this code that we want to persist mainly, or not the code rather, but parts of our results that we want to persist. So it's fine. The container um, can come and go and the code base will be, will come and go basically. But what we want more, more often than not is for our results after we run this code or this software, we want to have the images and we want to have the SNR files. And so that's what these two dash V commands are just mounting these directories that will include 
that uh, output of the software so that the next time you run the container, you won't have to reprocess all of your results. And finally, the last thing here is this UNAV, code, UNAV Docker GNSS REFL latest, and that is a reference to the Docker Hub image of GNSS REFL and tagged as the latest one. And so if I run this, for me, it, it, I get this um, immediate, now I'm inside this container because I've already built this image on my machine. For you, it may take up to a few minutes as it has to build this image from, or the image is built, but has to pull the image from the hub onto your local machine. And so now if I, if I look at, I have this GNSS raffle directory. And if I look at what's inside there, it looks a lot like the GitHub repository for good reason. Um, and then right now we're immediately, we can do this homework zero without setting any, you know, if I ch check my, for instance, my environment variables, well, there's a lot in here, I guess, but you can see my ref full code orbits and path and uh, exe should be set. Oh, there's exe, they're out of order. But so anyhow, this is, that was it. It's running. It might, like I said, it might take you a few minutes to build the image, not that you're doing anything. It's just going to be running and then you're going. So there's no, there should be no um, managing of dependencies uh, or environment variables or executables. And then if I want to, I could just exit out and I'm, the container is still running, but now I'm back into my terminal. And if I wanted to, you can either go through the desktop or there's a, you can stop and or remove the image via the terminal as well. I think it's, was it Kelly Docker stop? the image um, or Docker RF, the image, which in this case, the image is that GNSS report. Yeah, so the Docker image RM would remove the image, um, or you can remove the Docker using Docker RM with the container name. But just to stop the Docker, you would say Docker stop and then the name of the container. So I think, you know, or at least my intuition for some people, because this was how I felt, <laughs> Is that if you aren't familiar with Docker, it might be a little like, well, you know, what is this? Uh, but I think it's a really, I'm biased, but if you're, if you're having issues, I think it's worth uh, experimenting with. And even if you're not having issues, because I think there, uh, there are a lot more applications that are using Docker or containers or some version of it. And uh, I think it's, it can be really powerful and useful. But so with that in mind or anything else in mind related to the command line installation, if you have questions, please, um, just to give us a sense of the scope here, just maybe raise your hand or and or start posting them into the chat. Um, the chat's really helpful because then we can kind of get at them one at a time. And then you can also, we found it, a lot of them, if you end up needing like kind of very specific errors, it's good to see them printed out in, in the chat. It's hard to do it. At least it's hard to hear somebody read an error out sometimes, <laughs> at least for me. So Rainey says, I can't get that first Docker run command to work. And it looks like it's my environment variables. However, they show up when I echo them. Well, if, if I think I understand this question, the, the um, I guess it would help to, to see what you, when you run the Docker run command, what is the uh, output on the, in the terminal? 
But in general, the, uh, the environment variables, you shouldn't need to set them at all. Actually, if you're using the Docker, the Docker itself in that container will set those variables. Oh, there, hi, hi, Rainy. <laughs> hi, yeah, so the error I'm getting says invalid mode and it's the directory to my ruffle code variable. If it helps, I can share. Sure. Either okay. copy and paste or share, whichever. I think I think you should be able to share your screen. Okay, great. Let me try. Can you see that okay? It's a little small, but that might just be my screen. Maybe I'll try and oh, there zoom in. So I just ran, let's see. I tried re-pulling this again, and then I just ran this, and then I get this error. I can't figure out why it is. Error response. I am not familiar with that. Kelly, are you? But we could. I have not, not seen it. Have, have you run this command before? Or is this the first time you're running it? I run it a few times, yeah, and I get the same error. Okay. Wonder, um, just to remove. Currently, oh, go, go ahead. Do you currently have the container running? Oh, no. So maybe I'm missing a step. Well, so um, if you currently have the container already, and I, I mean, I don't think this is the error because you would normally get a different error. Um, but if you're trying to create the container and it already exists, sometimes that can be an issue. Um, mm, okay. But I don't know if that's what this error is, but it, it could be good to check. Okay, yeah. I didn't see it. Like when you pulled up your Docker, I couldn't see the container. So maybe I didn't pull it correctly or something. I can check that. I guess maybe there's a step that I'm missing just to set up, or maybe is there an in-between step between pulling this and running this command to get the container set up? Well, Kelly, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, it shouldn't be because the, the very last line um, in that command is telling it which image to pull from. Uh, if the image okay. doesn't exist locally, it goes to the Docker Hub and grabs it for you. So it'll pull down that image. Um, okay. If you run um, Docker container ls, that'll just list the containers that you currently have. Yeah, so you don't have any containers running. Um, I think the other command is docker image ls. See if you have an image already. So the image is there, okay. Hmm. It, it might if you just remove the image just to, and redo it or something. Yeah, I would, you could try that. Um, that would be Docker image remove and then the name of the image. Image RM or do you spell out remove for Docker? Yeah, sorry, okay. RM. And then this is just the, this one here. Do you know Docker? Yes. Okay. Yep, that's the one. Yeah, it's weird. It looks like you have two, and it shouldn't necessarily do that if they're named the same. Um, mm. And then, yeah, now do an image ls again, um, Docker image ls. 
Yeah, and, and try to yeah, run the so... same remove command. Re remove that other one there. OK. Um, I think that's okay. Maybe so. Now try running the the overall the Docker run command. Oh, this didn't happen before. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, it's um sometimes there's a little wonky stuff that happens, and I find that removing everything and trying again often <laughs> is the solution. Awesome. Hopefully that fixes it. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Of course. Joe, Joe had asked about the or the notebook version where the token yeah. comes from. Yeah. So I was I was gonna mention um with the with the Jupyter notebook, sometimes if if you have another browser open that's already accessing port um 8888, then it'll sometimes open up into a page that's requesting a token. Um, and that's so that sometimes you can open two of them at the same time using a different token. So if you do have another window open, you could try to um, remove, um, exit out of that window, make sure you're only accessing the port once. Yeah, I, I don't have uh, anything open on, on that port. So I've tried cutting and pasting from the original installation, which includes, you know, token equals blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And it goes to a page that says, I need a token or a password. Yeah. Um, and I've tried, you know, going from Docker and running GNSS reflection and then using the open in browser mm -hmm. and again, get a, get a token. So I did try and set up a password, but it doesn't seem to like that right or um it, rather i should say mm -hmm. interesting um dot jupiter you know jupiter config uh yeah and then you did you did try pasting the the token that it gives you into where it's requesting a token it's yeah so it seems like exited it uh so i exited docker stopped running it closed mm -hmm. uh chrome came back in and you know, even if I put in, if I put in the short, you know, a local host 8088, uh, mm -hmm. it'll ask me for a password or a token. Or if I put in the whole HTTPS that includes, you know, dollar token, blah, 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 blah. It always comes back to password or token login. Interesting. Huh. Um, i to try to think about what else that could be. As I said, usually for me, when that's happened, it's because I'm, I have another window open somewhere with it, but um, I'll see if I can try to find another uh, solution to get that to work for you. Yeah, I don't know what I'm doing wrong, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I totally understand, it can be confusing. Um, but let, let me play around with my version and see okay. if I can recreate it, find, it, find the issue. Alrighty, thank you. Kelly, I was just going to say we could, we could change that 888 port mapping just in case there is something running for him. At that, those that's ports. true too. Um, so if you're if you um, remove the image in the container and run it again, and you can change the port in that command and see if maybe um, that might help. That's that's a good point too. That's actually probably what I would try next. Joe, so basically sense. just uh, remove the whole container and run the command again and start over. Yeah, so I would run, um, you have to stop the stop the container. So it's Docker stop with the name of the container and then Docker RM, um, the container. And then I would remove the image as well, just kind of start over and um, use that same one line command and then maybe just try changing the port. So if I'm actually using the Docker app, I would just you know hit the stop button and yep. hit the trash and can. Then the trash. Okay. Yeah, and then if you go over to images as well, um, you can remove the image. I don't know if that would be necessary, but sometimes starting from scratch can help. Okay, okay. 
Yeah, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll go back and reinstall everything. Thank you. Yeah, you could try something like 8089 or whatever. Yeah. Oh, I'll just go back and make sure that it's not all weirded out. Okay, thank right. you. Oh, it looks like Tanya had a solution that worked for them. Yeah, so getting into the command line in the container, you can run Jupyter Notebook list and it will give you the running um, token that will work for your notebook. Thanks for that. Yeah. Um, any other questions? <laughs> We're hoping that silence means things are working. <laughs> yeah. Where is where is everybody from? <laughs> we could we could just be good to know if y'all whatever if anybody feels like typing it in the chat or speaking up. It's exciting to see such a big group. Hi guys, this is Brad again. I'm uh, from Edmonton, Alberta. Oh, wow. Yeah. So thanks again for your help. This has been really useful. Uh, yeah, yeah this, this is very useful for us as well. It's really great to see how things are and are not working, so. Oh, we've got Germany, Canada, Germany. Yeah, we were hoping we could set a time for these that work. Uh, not always easy to set time, work with time zones uh, to get everyone together. So glad to see so many people are here. Italy too. Yeah, especially yeah for you all in Europe. This is getting on the end of the end of the day, I imagine. Well, I guess, I guess with that in mind, especially with so many people in Europe, if there's, if you have any questions, we'll be leaving this Zoom open um, until certainly if we're going to check in at, at noon as well. Um, but otherwise, we, you know, we appreciate you all being here and coming and we'll look forward to seeing you all virtually on the 21st. And if you have questions on the homework, the best way is the Slack, because then as much as we can use that, because then you can work with your, collaborate more with your uh, fellow students and they can see your questions and vice versa. But, um, but if you aren't a Slack user, just email uh, Kelly, Christine, and or I.
Well, Kelly, I'm gonna keep. I'm just gonna mute myself, but uh, I'll be. I'll just. I'll just stay here in case somebody, some question comes up. Same. Yeah. I'll probably I... be working on these other questions from the last one. So. So thank you all.